Welcome to the Law School Toolbox podcast. Today, we're talking about how to make the most out of your second semester of law school. Your Law School Toolbox hosts are Allison Monahan, that's me, and Lee Burgess. We're here to demystify the law school and early legal career experience so you'll be the best law student and lawyer you can be. We're the co-creators of the Law School Toolbox, the Bar Exam Toolbox, and the Catapult Career Conference. And I also run the Girl's Guide to Law School. If you enjoy the show, please leave a review on iTunes. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to us. You can always reach us via the contact form on lawschooltoolbox.com, and we would love to hear from you. With that, let's get started. Welcome back. Today, we're talking about making the most of your second semester of law school. Now, by now, you have probably have some or all of your grades back, so it's a good time to take stock of where you are and make any changes necessary to get the most out of your second semester. So really, what does everybody care about? Grades. So let's let's just get right (laughs) to it. Let's talk about grades. Let's talk about grades. They're just the elephant in the room um, at most schools, and no one likes to talk or think about them, really. But you've got to because they're kind of important, unfortunately, right? Yeah, I mean, I think there's this weird, like, culture of secrecy around law school grades that I'm not sure was the case in, like, other schools that I'd gone to. Suddenly, it was like, you know, I feel like an undergrad, if I took a class with a friend, I would just ask them what they got in the class. But Mm -hmm. law school is not really like that. Well, I think that's partly because (laughs) so many people get grades they feel disappointed by. Right, exactly. I mean, I guess we should sort of talk about first, like, what are these first semester grades, particularly if you're a 1L, what do these really indicate? I mean... What if you did poorly? Is your career just totally over? I mean, should you drop out? <laughs> I mean, you know, dropping out is probably an extreme solution. So I wouldn't necessarily suggest dropping out unless you decide that, you know, you're doing performing so poorly that you can't recoup, you know, i.e. you're failing out. Um, but I don't think your career is necessarily over. But if I think the end of your first semester is a very interesting time where you have the ability to save this. You know, you can get away with having some disappointing grades your first semester, partly because of the curve. The curve is so strict. Um, But you have, like, the ability to do an upswing, (laughs) you know, to be able to say, hey, I made some mistakes, but I did better. I learned from my mistakes and I did better. Where, you know, later on, if you've got three or four semesters of disappointing grades, you know, it's a, it's a different story to tell. So I don't think your yeah, career's I mean, over. You just have to show that you've got some sort of trajectory. Yeah, I mean, nobody is really going to buy, like, better third-year grades because, like, of course you're getting better grades, hopefully, by your third year because you're picking your classes. Like, you're taking stuff you want to take. You're probably taking, like, writing classes that don't really have a curve. But, you know, if somebody has – a you know, a grade or two first semester that they're not happy with. But then, as you said, you turn around and second semester, you do a lot better. That's not a hard story. That's, you know, oh, yeah, of course, you know, in a job interview or clerkship interview or whatever, you know, I got some disappointing results. It really forced me to evaluate how I was doing, what I was doing. I made some changes. And as a result, as you can see, you know, I improved my grades a lot. People will buy that. Yeah, and they did because I had a bit of that story. I mean, my grades weren't terrible first semester, but they definitely went up after that first semester. And I, that's exactly what I told employers at Big Firm Interviews. You know, they would, especially I was doing litigation. Litigators love to call you out on anything that shows weakness on your right. application. <laughs> um, and so what's interesting is you can tell them that story, but yeah, you've got to have stuff to back it up. And remember somebody saying to me like, wow, this legal writing score is kind of disappointing, you know, how do you think this really reflects what you can do? And my, I got to say, well, look at my next legal writing score where I high scored the class. Clearly, I learned something. Isn't that exactly who you want working for you? <laughs> you know, I mean, right. that's that's a good story to tell. But if you don't, you know, if you don't have that story, it it can be challenging. I've I've been talking recently to students later on in their academic careers who've had, you know, four semesters of disappointing grades, and they're worried about job prospects. It's it's a little harder to, you know sell a bad grade when you have had four semesters to try and fix stuff and you haven't really been able to. Right. I mean, at that point, you're also looking at some serious problems on the bar exam. Yes. You know, I mean, the, the reality is bar exam performance, while not perfectly correlated with your grades, is highly correlated with your grades. It is. So, you know, occasionally that person fails that you don't expect to fail. But a lot of the people who fail, if you look at their transcripts and, you know, they're going through four or six semesters and getting, you know, pretty poor marks that's going to be a sign that you've got a problem. 
Right, only because, you know, the bar exam is all about essays and multiple choice. And shockingly enough, typically that's what your first year classes are. <laughs> so if you don't know how to execute an essay or a multiple choice exam, um, those problems don't go away. I think what can happen in law school is you oftentimes start taking paper classes or seminars and you forget that these core exam taking skills are really what's required for the biggest gatekeeping exam coming up, which is the bar exam. Yeah. So, I mean, I think it's important not to totally blow your first semester grades out of proportion. And I think it's also important to really to kind of understand, you know, if we say like, oh, did you do poorly? Like, what does that even mean? You know, some people, I mean, a lot of people, I mean, most law students basically are used to getting most of their grades being some variant of an A. Mm -hmm. So to say that you got like straight B pluses, that doesn't really mean you did poorly. Like you're still basically like you're above average, most likely at that point. Exactly. Um, so, so I think there's a little bit of calibration of expectations that has to happen too. Um, you know, I mean, if you're getting like well below the, I guess the point is like you need to know what the midpoint of the curve is at your school because it varies widely. At some schools, a B is a terrible grade. At some schools, a B is a very good grade. Mm-hmm. So it's not just about, oh my God, I got Bs. I'm doing horribly. I'm going to flunk out. It's like, if you're above the mean, well, you're doing better than half your class. Right. It's very important to learn that about your school. And then sometimes they will also put out class rankings as well. So you can see where you fall in the population of students. And again, depending on the school, that can be really more important than what your actual GPA is. You know, sometimes jobs just care what percentage of the class you're in, not as much about, you know, what your GPA is, because they just want to know how you performed against your peers. Right. And I mean, a lot of the top schools, like you're literally like there's no class ranking. You're not allowed to put your GPA on your resume. Um, So, you know, it really varies a lot by school because, Mm -hmm. you know, but the point is, I mean, most people are probably going to see at least one grade that they're not happy about. Mm -hmm. I think there's a difference between that and someone who's really at or near the bottom of the curve and struggling in all of your classes. Yeah, like if you're consistently at the bottom of the curve, then there's some systemic problems that you definitely need to fix. If you bombed one class, then it becomes a little bit more about, you know, what happened in that class and how can you remedy that and make sure that that doesn't happen in more classes next semester. Right. I mean, it's just, you know, you got to really like look at these and you got to hear what your transcript is telling you. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> it's it's very true. There's a lot of information that comes out of that. And hey, if you did great and you're listening to this podcast going, why am I even listening to this podcast? Because I'm at the top of my class. Probably because you're an overachiever, which is why you're at the top of the class. Right. But here's some fair warning. It's actually very easy to slip from the top of your class. Um only because everybody else has a learning curve too, and they're all going to get better at exams. And so if you don't stay on top of your game and become even a better law student, you're not necessarily going to be able to keep that piece, you know, keep that part on the curve um, when everyone else becomes a bit better at what they're doing. Right. I mean, for me, you know, I did very well first semester and it actually, like the stress and the pressure were, you know, you think like, oh, you're, you're good to go. You don't have to worry anymore. But I found out it was actually the opposite. And I basically had like a total breakdown. Um, and I did a lot worse second semester. So it's not the case that just because you did well, like that you're guaranteed to be, you know, your life is going to be perfect. It's just right. not really the way things work. Yeah. And, you know, hey, what if your grades are mixed? Should you decide that if you got an A in criminal law, but you got a C in real property, but you've always wanted to be a real estate attorney, that you shouldn't be a real estate attorney? No, because grades do not (laughs) typically reflect uh, any sort of performance. I know a ton of attorneys who love to tell stories about the worst grades they got in law school, typically being the classes that ended up being the direction they went in with their careers. Yeah, I mean, I think, again, like, you've got to keep this in perspective. Um, You should not base your entire career for the next 40 plus years of your life around one law school grade. Right. You know, if there's a class of an exam. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Like, you should not base your entire career on three hours. Yeah. I mean, that being said, you know, fine, like, take take what these great grades are telling you. And maybe you see like, oh, I am doing better in certain types of classes or on certain types of exams and things like that. But yeah, I mean, if you've always wanted to be a criminal attorney, and for some reason you bombed crim law, well, you know, take some advanced classes, do really well in them. And then when you're in interviews, you can tell a funny story about what happened on that test. Exactly. I mean, again, a lot of this is just about how you're going to spin this reality. You know, 
do everything you can to make sure that you do better next time and then figure out what your story is going to be so you can explain it to people. Because really, that's that's what it's about um, as far as the jobs are concerned, is what, how are you going to spin this story? Yeah, I mean, I'm not going to lie to you. If you did really well first semester, you're probably going to have a lot easier time getting a summer job your one ill year. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's the way reality, it works. Because the only <laughs> grades they're going to have are those first semester grades. I mean, But just... you know what? Like, you're in the position you're in, and there's nothing you can do about those grades. So if you're not in a position where, you know, you can just send your resume and people are going to be like, oh, my God, they got straight A's at Harvard. Oh, I totally want to talk to this person. Um, that means that you're going to have to hustle. And it's not the end of the world. We have a whole podcast on that, in fact. Yeah. But remember, they don't even give A's at Harvard. It's all passes and high pass and all of that. Oh, nonsense. did they do that too? I can't I think even remember. So. I think so. Last yeah, I think time. you're right. Yeah, yeah, I think you're right. But anyway. Well, um, anyway, the other, straight A's at Columbia. They that's still right. do <laughs> So the other thing I would think as about. As far as I know, I don't know. <laughs> as, the other thing that I would think about with, you know, impacting your summer job search is if you did struggle, if you did falter, that doesn't mean that you're not going to get any sort of work, but you may need to think outside the box a little bit. It just makes networking um, more important, it makes relying on you know possibly past experience. If you worked before law school, um, making sure your cover letter and your resume are absolutely one hundred percent perfect, not one typo or extra space anywhere. You know you have to rely on different ways that you can differentiate yourself because you're not just going to be the person in the pile who has the top GPA. Yeah, I mean you know when. People are doing on-campus interviewing for their 1L, like big law positions, which used to happen back in the day, probably still does a few places. But, you know, I remember going into an interview and I saw the guy I had my transcript on his desk and he had highlighted my grades. And like, clearly that was why they brought me in. Yeah. But everybody else in the class basically found a job too. Yeah. So the reality is it may not be as simple if your grades aren't what they are, but it's still possible. The other thing, you know, depending on your school and depending on your interests, sometimes if you're having trouble securing a job in the in the full legal profession, um, you know, a full-time internship or something like that, sometimes going back to professors in those courses that you either did really well in or that you're really engaged in, sometimes they'll have research positions over the summer. Sometimes they, there may even be clinics who run programming over the summer. There oftentimes are different opportunities that if you hustle a little bit, you know, something we talk about all the time, then you may even learn that there are going to be more opportunities than you think. So, just keep an open mind and get a little creative to make sure that you have something interesting on your resume from that first summer. Right, because law school obviously and definitely is not all about grades. I mean, people can get really fixated on this, but a lot of it, you know, a lot of the job stuff, particularly in certain types of law, are really based on who you know. Do these people trust you? Do they like you? Do they think you do good work? Um, I mean, as I said, we have a whole podcast on summer jobs, but I think in addition to, you know, figuring out how to improve your academic performance, which we can talk about in a minute, I think you do want to be thinking, what are you going to do to advance your career? You know, and this mm-hmm. needs to be on a weekly and a monthly basis. This is, you know, this is the sort of thing where everyone has great intentions, but those intentions tend to fall by the wayside unless you actually put it on your schedule. Mm-hmm. I think that's very true. And when you are investing that time and energy into it, you know, utilizing your resources, talking to your career services or whoever your advisors are, but also to be realistic about your situation and what you need to do to get a job. I mean, if you are at the bottom of your class, you know, clerkship applications are probably not going to go well. So <laughs> at least you know, not for like federal for you know, feder- appellate clerkships. Exactly. Or so like that could be really tough. So you need to say, okay, well, I still really think clerk sh- clerking somewhere for a judge is the next step in my career. Let's figure out what those options are going to be. Is it going to be a superior court judge somewhere? Is it going to be, you know, I mean, I mean, th- I mean, there's so many different ones. <laughs> but yeah, there's, there's so many options. There's so many options. But th- I guess my point is, instead of rattling off the options, is to just think about, okay, well, maybe, you know, this path A of a, you know, of a federal clerkship is not going to work out for me. But how can I make this my reality? How can I still get an experience that's going to add value? And what do I need to do to invest in that? That's super important. You know, spending all your energy thinking about, um, pipe dreams that really, I mean, we don't want to like be negative, but that aren't going to work with your path. I think it just makes it even more important that you be realistic and that you still excel in all the possible ways that you can to start your career off right. 
Well, and also that you're creative about it. I mean, say that you're dead set on working for a federal judge, but, you know, I'm not going to tell you after one semester that your grades are not good enough for that, but say you're on your second year and you're looking at your grades and you're like, okay, I'm consistently below the mean, whatever. Maybe you could do some sort of externship with a judge, you know, Mm -hmm. get the same sort of experience without that competitive process, which is highly competitive still of applying for a federal clerkship. You know, you've got to kind of think creatively and not, you know, people I think sometimes can get really depressed if like, oh, this is my dream of doing this. I, I was dying to be a Supreme Court clerk and it's just not going to happen. It's like, okay, that was probably never going to happen anyway. <laughs> <laughs> there just aren't that sorry, many of like, them. I mean, <laughs> I mean, you know, even at Yale, like that's not really like even beginning to be a guarantee. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I mean, you know, I think it's sort of easy to get fixated on whatever it is. But I think you're absolutely right. You know, you've got to be realistic about your options and then make the most of the options that are actually available to you. Yeah, because I think for most people, there are options. You've just got to go out and hustle to get them. Yeah, and you know, I think in terms of like things you can put on your schedule that can move your career forward and often can move your career forward in ways that you would never predict. I mean, you and I met on Twitter and then had coffee and the second time we went to lunch, decided to start a business. Like we couldn't have predicted that. No. So- you know, things like networking events, your school might sponsor them or bar association programs, any sort of school event. Um, but then you can also reach out to individuals, you know, people you're interested mm-hmm. in, informational interviews, setting up coffee dates. Uh, on the Girls Guide site, we have an entire series that literally tells you exactly what to write in an email if you would like to do an informational interview with someone. Yep. And you'd be surprised, actually, at how helpful people are often willing to be. It's very, very true. All right, so we've talked a lot about you know the realities of these grades. So now that you have this information, that you you have a GPA, you have your grades. <laughs> we're um, not, we're not all living in la la land. We're all going to be in the top ten percent anymore. Right, Real, reality is setting in. <laughs> reality is setting in now. What do you do next? <laughs> well, I think I mean, I think people need to get assuming that you're not entirely pleased with your grades, which almost no one will be. You know, you've got to get real about your study habits and how they may have correlated with your grades. Mm-hmm. You know, like we talked to people. I mean, I remember last semester talking to potential tutoring students a few, like literally weeks before their first exam. And, you know, I asked them, like, well, what are your goals? And they say, well, I really need to be in the top 10 percent. Like, OK. I'm like, have you started outlining? No. Have you taken any practice exams? No. Have you been doing your reading? No. It's like, what the hell do you think is going to happen? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I expect to hear back from a number of those people later. But, you know, it's just like, of course, you're not going to be in the top 10%. Like someone is out there doing all the work and it's not you. Yeah, exactly. And I think especially if you get a mixed bag of grades, then I think it's really important to see if you did one thing for one class and not for the other. So let's say you loved crim and you spent, you know, extra time reading supplements and really struggling with material and you had your study group had a lot of fun working on hypos together and then you did really well but you hated property and um you know you just didn't want to sit around and talk about vertical and horizontal privity oh, which God, please no uh, hey i know your right? interest exactly like, ah. yeah but hey i get it but the thing is like those classes have the same value or sometimes real property has more based on gpa and units and so You have to see if it was because you didn't like the class, that sucks, but you're going to have other classes that you didn't like. Right, or people tell me like, oh, I I don't like the professor. It's like, well, too bad. Yeah, you got to make it work. (laughs) Like, I'm sorry. Like, I don't get to tell you I don't like my boss at the law firm and I'm not going to work for a project with them. Like, yeah. You're a grown up, you know, or I don't like the judge or I don't like whoever it might be. Oh, yeah. Like that case got assigned to a bad judge. You're going to go and tell your client you're going to lose because you don't like the judge. I yeah, mean, come exactly. On. Exactly. And I think the other mistake that people make is when they think about their study habits, they don't really go back to the beginning of the semester. And I think that is really critical. You know, you need to look at how you were preparing for class. You need to look at at what point were you starting to use supplements? At what part were you starting to do deep work? You know, at what point were you starting to outline? what point did you start doing um, practice exams? You, know, you really need to think through all of your study habits and not just like the last few weeks because oftentimes problems can happen very early on. We just don't notice them until we're trying to scramble and do practice exams like two days before the exam. Right. And I think it's, you know, this is the sort of thing, like I think you need to do a really thorough self-diagnosis, but mm-hmm. it's also hard to kind of figure out sometimes what went wrong 
just sitting in a room by yourself. Yep. Ideally, I think you really want to talk to someone. So I mean, at a minimum, you know, we would strongly encourage you to go talk to each of your professors about your exams. Yep. But you might want to also talk with, you know, your TA or someone in academic support services about what happened. We actually are getting ready to release a brand new course called Reboot, where you can talk to a law school tutor and we'll walk you through the process of figuring out basically what happened. Because if you didn't do well and you don't know what happened, what do you know? Like, how are you going to change that? Mm -hmm. You're not going to be able to change it. You know, if you just do the same thing, you're going to get the same results. Yep. And other people and other people are going to be looking really carefully and like really analyzing their problem areas and probably doing deliberate practice to get better. Right. So if anything, if you keep doing the same thing, you're probably going to do even worse than you did this semester. That's it's, just the reality. I mean, yeah. it's harsh, but that's the reality. Yeah, but I think that's very true. And no one likes to go talk to your professors. I remember going to talk to my professors about my exams. Nobody likes to do that unless you uh, your exam had w- was selected to be the sample answer. But you know what? One of my exams was selected to be the sample answer. I didn't have to go talk to that professor about the class, <laughs> about my <laughs> my exam. You know, I was pretty sure I did pretty well. You know, there wasn't a lot of feedback available from that professor. Yeah, but, I'll be honest. I never once went and talked to a professor really? about the exam. I don't think I ever saw my exams afterwards. I mean, I would look at the sample answer mm-hmm. and I would look at their analysis, but I don't think I ever actually reviewed any of my answers, to be honest. I did some and it's not fun. I mean, you really have to, if especially if it's a grade that you're not proud of, you have to really sit with it and go through a kind of a vulnerable process of self-evaluation. I think um, a lot of people don't like going to talk to professors because they feel like their professors are going to look down on them or not want to help them because they struggled. And I think this is a really good time to remember that, you know, they know what the curve is. They know that they had to, you know, they had bubbled in those grades. <laughs> they know the realities. Um, they also know what grade you got by the time that they submitted those you know, those class um, yeah, grades they grade, to registrar. Yeah, mostly, generally they grade blind, but then they, you know, do their like, did you participate in class type of adjustments after the fact. So yeah. they, they know they know what grade you they got. They know what grade you got. And if they like you and you've put in the work and you didn't perform well, most of them want to help you. And I've actually heard some positive, of course, some negative too, but some positive stories about professors being very, very helpful. I know of professors who, for some students, have been able to flag for them that they likely have a learning disability based on seeing things that came out of their work or um, being able to really talk to them about their writing you know, or a willingness to um, provide them extra counseling or help. I mean, professors generally like students and want to help you succeed. So if you're right. willing to go in the room, be vulnerable, come at it with a growth mindset and, you know, get help. Most of them want to help you. Yeah, I remember my first semester before we took the exam, our professor saying, look, I'm not going to judge you based on your grade on this exam. Like, I understand this process. He's like, you know, if you were someone who enjoyed this class and you participated and you come to my office after the fact and you totally bombed the test, I'm still going to write you a letter of recommendation because I don't base your value on what you did in a three-hour test. Exactly. I think that's really important. And, you know, you do need to build these relationships with these professors and actually going to them for help is a great way to build those relationships. What you do with a stumbling block and some sort of, you know, failure or disappointment shows a lot about your character and a lot about the type of lawyer you're going to be. Yeah, exactly. I mean, if I'm, you know, if I put myself in the perspective of the average law professor and I have a student who was really involved in class, they were always, you know, clearly on top of the material, they don't do well in the test and they come and talk to me about it. I'm going to respect that. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, like that person's looking to learn. They're looking to do better. I'm here to teach them. Like, that's my job. Yeah. I'm not saying everyone thinks like that, but generally speaking, you know, I think people, professors will respect you if you go in with the attitude of, I just want to hear how to do better. And, you know, one interesting point is if you did knock it out of the park and you, you know, high scored half of your classes and you are thinking about transferring for some reason, it also may behoove you to go make appointments with those professors where you did knock it out of the park because you need to start laying the groundwork for the recommendations and things that might be needed to, in order to transfer. So really, you sh- no matter how you did, you should probably go try and talk to your professor about yeah, it. Yeah, I mean, I think the second semester is definitely a time to try to build stronger relationships with at least a few of your professors because you're going to need their help and advice. You're going to need them to write letters. 
you know, so stay in touch with people. Like, ask if you can stop by for office hours, even if you're not taking a class. Mm -hmm. You know, go for coffee. Go to panels and events where they might be speaking, and then you can follow up questions mm -hmm. or comments, you know, in person or even an email. I mean, who's not going to appreciate an email from a former student that you taught last semester saying, hey, I caught that panel you were doing about, you know, your pet topic of interest, or I read your recent law review article. I thought that was really interesting. You know, I had a question about this. Can I come talk to you about it? Yeah. And that's most, impressive. Yeah. And most professors will be like, you want to come talk about something that I did that you think was amazing? Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, you'd like to come and talk about my pet idea, please. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I mean, because I think students don't realize, like, professors are vulnerable, too. Yeah. You know, they're putting their work out in the world. I mean, I remember I was helping a professor edit a book. And, you know, this guy was, like, world famous. was making, like, thousands of dollars an hour as a consultant. You know, he was a big deal. And he sent me his first draft. And it was, like, I really – I mean, I'm sure it's not very good. So, like, please be gentle. I mean, I don't – I know I don't really know what I'm talking about here. So, like, please don't say anything too rude. And I was just like, oh, wow. They're actually people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And also, put yourself in your professor's shoes. Like, it's actually kind of disappointing when you read exams from students um, that didn't get what you were teaching. <laughs> yeah. You know? I have, a lot of, I have some professor friends at this point who are like, wow, I felt really awful reading these because I realized I had done a terrible job. Yeah. You know, I think there is something to that. And so if the, if you didn't get what they were teaching a professor often wants to you know, one make sure it wasn't their fault but two to to help you get it eventually yeah sure exactly because a lot of these are bar courses like we talked about i mean mm -hmm. if you hated one of your first year first semester classes it's not like you get to forget about it forever you're gonna see it again yep yeah it just comes back to haunt you gotta love it yeah yeah okay but law school isn't just about grades right <laughs> i mean no i mean i think it there are a lot of activities that are pretty interesting second semester mm -hmm. um, that I think are worth thinking about from the beginning. I mean, a lot of people may be doing a moot court, and that's a whole other sort of world of its own. We, in fact, have a podcast you can listen to on moot mm -hmm. court. In fact, I think we may even have two. Um, but also, I think it's not too early to start thinking about the journal process. Mm -hmm. I think that's very true because, you know, that comes up typically really, really quickly right after exams. And if that's something you're interested in, you want to make sure that you have all your ducks in a row so you have the time to do the write-on, you know when it's going to be, you don't schedule like a vacation or something like that. Or as I did, let me tell you my completely stupid 1L summer thing. I was like, oh, I need to start working at my job. I'll give myself like three days to do the write-on after exams. That should be plenty of time. We had like a week or a half for it or something. Mm -hmm. That was incredibly stupid. Yeah. Don't do that. Don't do that. <laughs> so. <laughs> do not schedule work, even if they're paying you a lot, during the time that you're given to do the journal write-on because you will just basically make your life absolutely horrible. Mm -hmm. I think second semester is a great time to start um, getting more involved in the school if you have special areas of interest in student organizations um, or, you know, if there's a group that's doing talks on stuff that you're interested in, it's a great time to just spend a little more time doing some extracurriculars so you can get more involved in the school and build relationships and, and again, differentiate yourself. Yeah, I know for me, like first semester, I just kind of joined like 20 different groups because I was like, oh, this sounds kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. But I think second semester is really a time to start focusing um, you know, maybe you found that five of those were actually things that you found that you went to consistently after you signed up on their mailing list. Um, but, you know, I mean, start to think about, do you want to be an officer for next semester, mm -hmm. you know, next year? How does that work? Who do you need to butter up to, to make that happen? Cause you really, you know, as you go through law school, you're learning more and more about the type of law that you're interested in, that you want to practice. And it's important, I think, to focus your interests so that your resume ultimately makes sense. Mm-hmm. Oh, and let's go back to the journal process again, because another thing that you can do as a second semester is sometimes journals who aren't the law review will actually hire second semester one else to start doing True. some minor work for them. And that's really great for you to get more comfortable with the blue book, because typically there's going to be some sort of a blue book component to your write on process. And if you aren't loving your blue book yet, it's time to build a great relationship with it, including tabs, which really just took my blue book to a whole new level. Um, <laughs> 
I love how people are like, oh, do I need to have a paper one? I'm like, you probably want to. It's actually yeah, a lot easier. It is. It is. And, you know, you start to need to learn about the different journals on campus and see if there's, you know, if you're really into international human rights, if there's an international human rights journal, you want to start figuring out how you can get involved. Um, maybe you're even starting to think about note topics, um, something you might want to you know, eventually write about, you know, maybe well, you're even going to take a class early in your second year to help facilitate that process. You need to start having ideas uh, that you want to be chewing on. No, I definitely found for me, like when I joined the law review and second, first semester of second year, they're like, okay, so what are you going to write your note about? And it's just a moment of like, what are you talking about? Mm-hmm. Like, I don't know anything. Yeah. Um, so I think if you, you know, if your school is one that kind of front loads the note process, you do sort of want to be thinking about like, well, what kind of topics might you want to write about? Who might you want to work with? And that kind of thing, because it's going to come up really fast. It is. It is. And then it's time, especially before academics gets too crazy to go out and try and become a member of the legal community, you know, try and look for speaking events, see what the bar association is putting on, see if there are fundraisers where you can meet different people or whatever it might be, you know, network with alumni, you know, sometimes alumni will take you to things. You know, I was at, yeah. a, um, we, I was at a fundraiser, our, the law school toolbox sponsored um, the Bayview Hunters Point community legal fundraiser last um, fall. And I took law students with me so they could go meet other lawyers. And then we all started around with a bunch of my law school friends or people that I worked with at the law schools. <laughs> And they got to meet all those people and create networking relationships. So, and that's just because that's what people do. You know? I, mean, I mean, that's kind of that's like how this works. The, that's essentially because the people that you're talking about sent you an email at some point and were like, hey, here's my story. I would love to take you for coffee. Mm-hmm. And you're like, oh, my God, your story is amazing. I would love to go to coffee with you and do whatever I can to help you. Exactly. I mean, that's that's the type of law student you want to be in your second semester. And frankly, throughout your entire law school experience is, you know, that person who's putting themselves out there in a reasonable way, but, you know, really connecting with people because those are the people who are going to help you regardless of what your first semester grades were. Yep, exactly. Okay, well, what about something that people oftentimes never think about when it comes to evaluating your first semester, which is, um, you know, the greater being of kind of like, how did your life go? <laughs> you know, um, oh, are we allowed to think about that? Um, law you know, school? I know, but it turns out that life could actually have a lot of impact on how you're doing. So things we want students to really make sure you evaluate is, you know, were you eating crummy food and therefore sick and feeling bad all the time? Um, that can, you know, have a huge effect on how you're able to perform and your ability to focus and things like that. So can not exercising, you know, endorphins are a nice thing. They help keep yeah. your mood stable <laughs> as well as keeping you healthy. Um, oh, and then sleep. Sleep is a big one, don't you think? Yeah, well, I mean, I had ma- like massive issues with sleep at the end of my first semester during exams. I mean, I had chronic insomnia. I was allocating eight hours as I should in my schedule and being responsible. And then I would lay in bed for four hours and sleep for four hours. I was literally crazy after three weeks of doing this. So, you know, I had to deal with that basically, you know. And so I was like, all right, I probably need to like go to therapy because I'm having a total breakdown over the pressure of having good grades. <laughs> and I need to go to the student health service and talk to them about what I can do to sleep. Because that's not Mm -hmm. optional. Yeah, I think that's really true. Um, You know, I also think that you need to evaluate whether or not your social relationships are positive or negative. You know, some are elective, some are not. Can't, of course, necessarily control family relationships. But But um, you can compartmentalize. You can. The holidays might have been a good time to, you know alert you to some issues that maybe you need to start thinking about how to handle. Yeah, but, you know, elective relationships you have control over. So you need to think about, you know, surrounding yourself with positive people in your life, both within the law school environment and outside the law school environment to, you know, help move you in a good direction. Um, And then because we're talking about lawyers and, well, potential lawyers and law students, we should probably talk about alcohol. Yeah, alcohol and drugs. And drugs. Um, I mean, you know, the reality is a lot of lawyers have substance abuse problems, and a lot of these problems start in law school. Mm-hmm. You know, if you're concerned about your drinking habits, if you're concerned about any sort of drug use, I think that's something you want to deal with sooner rather than later because it's not going to get any better. Yeah. And needing to take time off to recharge. And were you really able to unplug? You know, I think, Allison, you and I have been reading a lot right now about dealing with 
um, this digital age. And I yes. think the election and the political climate made our digital lives really stressful, at least yours and mine. I'm sure other people out there are agreeing with us <laughs> just because of the amount of information that we find concerning that was spiraling around us. And I think a lot of really smart, high performing people are trying to figure out how to um, balance that, but also give ourselves time to be. Um, you know, you sent me an interesting article um, from someone that we follow who was talking about the importance of taking, wasn't it like 30 days of a calendar year off and kind of unplugged? It doesn't have yeah. to be consecutive, it just had to be 30 days. Yeah. And, you know, some of the most successful people at my law school were people who, mostly for religious reasons of one type or another, committed, even during the exam period, committed to taking at least an entire day off. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you might think, oh, my God, they only had six days to work instead of seven. Most of these people were on the law of you. Like, yeah. you know, <laughs> A, they were not wasting time going out drinking and partying because, mm -hmm. you know, that just wasn't part of what they did. But also, I think you know, having that time off really allows you to come back fresh in a way that working burned out, you just aren't getting as much accomplished. Yeah. So if you didn't take any time off during the semester last year and burnout was a real concern, make sure you mark them on your calendar. But I think the, the example you give of folks who mostly for religious reasons, but some just because of the way that they frame their lives, need that time off. It's dedicated. It's like, I'm going to take time off. I'm not going to feel guilty about it. I'm not going to stress out about needing to do something else. This is just how I'm building my life. Right, and you that's how you have to, it. Right. And that's how you have to do this. So it can't be like, oh, I'm just going to blow off work on Saturday and get totally behind. You have to say, okay, I need, I'm need. i taking every other Saturday off or whatever it is for you, and I'm going to plan my schedule around it. Right. I mean, that's the whole point is like you have to be deliberate about you, how you're using your time in every respect. Mm -hmm. and, you know, one really key area is are you taking time off? And then also, you know, are you doing deep work? Like when are your study periods? Are you really focused in those periods? I mean, all this stuff. Sorry, it sounds really boring, but you know, you're know, you a grown up and this is like a very difficult professional program. And the people who have control of their schedule are going to be the people who ultimately are happier and end up probably doing better as well. Yeah. And let me tell you, <clears throat> going back to the digital stuff, I myself am taking a bit of a Facebook diet and um, only using it for targeted tasks instead of letting myself scroll, scroll through it. But I am shocked just a few days into this about how much mental energy I was expending, like scrolling through social media. Like it's oh, yeah. just the things I was clicking on or reading or even reading about other people's lives or reflecting on my own life or this or that or whatever. A lot, just some, some quiet time. You know, you can also just like stand in line at the coffee shop and like stare at the ceiling. It's actually quite refreshing. If you, if you yeah, exactly. I mean, I think I sent you an article this morning about how all these programs and apps are designed to be addictive. Yep. And shockingly enough, people are like literally addicted to them. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something to be cognizant of. You know, they were talking in this article about how Snapchat, for example, was designed to be more addictive than Instagram. Wow. I mean, thank God I've never bothered installing Snapchat. Me too. But <laughs> not even opening that Pandora's box. <laughs> you know, it's just like these things, these are not neutral sort of things that are designed for your well-being. Right. And I think the sooner, you know, the more you kind of get a handle on that and really reflect on is this adding value to my life? Is this something I want to be spending my limited time on? I think that's worth giving some thought to. Yeah, it really. So, I, mean, I feel like the amount of social media interaction and even, you know, one of my friends was also, we were talking about this, was also talking about the exhaustion around even online dating and the information that comes in and the, um, if you're trying to balance that while you're in law school too, you know, you're getting emails and notifications and you're trying to, I mean, it's a lot, it's a lot. And you have to be very strategic on how to manage that because I think we don't give enough credit to how much brain power and energy are spent um, on all of these teeny tiny little tasks that we do all day. No, no, I can easily open up Twitter at midnight when I'm like about to go to sleep and I'm setting my alarm on my phone, which I should not be doing. But, you know, I'm like, oh, I'll just set my alarm and then go right to bed. And I find literally it's like an hour and a half later. And I'm like, how did this happen? Mm -hmm. What have I been doing? I know. Answer, I've been scrolling through Twitter and reading articles for the last hour and a half. Yeah. That's and they're probably of time. And they're probably not articles that are like calming to your nervous system. No, exactly. It's like you're not reading something on your Twitter feed unless it's like, oh my God, I have to know about this immediately. What what outrage is going on in the world right now? And you're like, okay, it's one in the morning. I should have just gone to bed. I should right. get like 
you know, I should just get like a battery operated alarm clock and stop doing this. <laughs> it's so true. It's so true. So so it's really worth um, evaluating and taking some time. I know I'm also I'm trying to make myself read books at night and like not even be like watch TV on my laptop or anything because that's the thing I crack open my laptop, even to watch TV, which we all know is terrible for you because of the blue light. But then it's like, Unless I turn off my Wi-Fi, I it's like I can't even stop my finger from checking my work email <laughs> before bed, you know? And like, come on. Like, we're responsive to our students, but you don't need to hear from me, like, at 11 o'clock at night. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, I think the key thing here is second semester really is this time to hit the reset button evaluate what worked, evaluate what's not working, and try to improve your experience going forward. Because there's still plenty of time, but you need to get started now. Yes. And of course, we can help. So there are two primary ways we can help if um, you're looking for new resources. Allison, why don't you share a bit more about our reboot camp that you were mentioning? Sure. Well, I've been hard at work on this. Uh, I'm actually (laughs) really excited about it, I got to say. So the idea here is Not everyone wants or needs full tutoring, which we can also offer you. We get that it's expensive and, you know, a lot of people have limited resources. So what we try to do with Reboot is really bring together what we would tell you if you were doing tutoring in a way that you can go through. And, you know, a lot of it's like watching videos and things like that. But you also have two interactive one-on-one sessions with a law school toolbox tutor at the beginning of the program and at the end of the program. And so basically it walks you through, here's a self-evaluation to help you figure out what's happened here's how to talk to your professors. We help you assemble all that information. You'll talk to the tutor and be like, okay, here's what I think happened. You know, they're going to review your work and be like, I think this is what happened. Here are the things you need to work on. You work on those things and then you come up with a plan and they review that plan with you. Because I think that accountability and having someone to talk through like, okay, this is what I think I would do with my time. Does this make sense? Is actually really valuable. Yeah, because all the stuff that we've been talking about, about self-evaluation and talking to your professors, you know, sometimes it can be even hard to know what to ask your professors. And we can help you with that, you know, how to go in with a list of questions, how to go in, you know, asking questions so you can really get that tangible information. So just having somebody walk you through this process and help you reevaluate your study skills, I think, I think can be really helpful. Well, of course we do. We created the course. (laughs) Hopefully we, yeah, we think hopefully it will be helpful. If not, yeah, we'll we'll give you a refund. Um, (laughs) All right. With that, unfortunately, we are out of time on this episode. If you enjoyed this episode of the Law School Toolbox podcast, please take a second to leave a review or rating on iTunes or your other favorite listening podcast app. We would really appreciate it. And be sure to subscribe so you don't miss anything. If you have any questions or comments, don't hesitate to reach out to Lee or me at lee at lawschooltoolbox.com or allison at lawschooltoolbox.com. And you can always contact us via our website contact form at lawschooltoolbox.com. Thanks for listening. We'll talk soon and good luck this semester.